I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's program on the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. We are New York's Holocaust Museum, and this event is not about the Holocaust, but it is about one of the worst incidents of racial violence in American history, and one that was covered in a veil of silence for far too long. We're proud to host this evening's conversation because it's our responsibility as Jews to draw connections between the Holocaust and other injustices, and because it's our responsibility as Americans to reckon with our own country's past. This is a particularly meaningful moment for us to host the discussion as well, because we're approaching the centennial of the massacre in about a month. As the nation's attention turns towards Tulsa, so does ours. We're here with our partners at Jewish Gen and Jews in All Hues, and we're here with a very esteemed panel uh, moderated by Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour, and with three excellent panelists. Dr. Hazia Diner is the Paul and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at New York University, a renowned historian, and uh, among her many books is In the Almost Promised Land, American Jews and Blacks, 1915 to 1935. Jonathan Silvers is a documentary filmmaker and founder of Saybrook Productions, who's directing Tulsa, The Fire and the Forgotten, a centennial exploration of the 1921 race massacre, which will premiere nationwide on PBS on May 31st at 9 p.m. Eastern. We hope you all had a chance to watch the 15 minute clip from Tulsa, The Fire and the Forgotten that we sent out in advance of this evening's discussion. It will remain available until Monday for streaming. And finally, Hannibal Johnson, an author, attorney, historian, uh, and civic leader in Tulsa, who chairs the Education Committee of the City Centennial Commission. He's features at his, featured as an expert in Jonathan's film, and he's authored several books, including Black Wall Street 100, An American City Grapples with Its Historical Racial Trauma, which you can order at the link in the Zoom chat. Welcome, Judy, Hannibal, Jonathan, and Hazia. Before our panelists begin their discussion, we're going to play a brief video clip to set the stage. This is a clip from Jonathan's upcoming PBS special. Once the clip is over, Judy will kick off the discussion. Audience members should feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box at any time. Without further ado, here's our clip. On Tuesday morning, May 31st, 1921, Greenwood was a beacon of black prosperity. Two days later, Greenwood was rubble and ash. Christy Williams has spent decades researching the atrocities of those days, which her great aunt escaped. The massacre began when a young black man was in an elevator with a young white woman. He bumped into the young white woman and she screamed. And then they said that this young black man assaulted this young white woman. The young black man was put in jail. When he was put in jail, all the men in Greenwood got together. They went down to City Hall to the jail where he was to protect him from being lynched. And they had guns with them, and there were tons of white men and police around the jail. And there was one black man who had a gun. One of the white men said, Nick, what are you gonna do with that gun? And he said, I'll use it if I have to. And they struggled for the gun. It just started a big fight. They were shooting at each other, running, trying to get away and they ran through downtown back into Greenwood. Then the looting started, and then the fires to the homes. My grandfather, being that he was a senior in high school, and my great aunt at the time, they were both at Booker T. Washington High School, and uh, seniors in that class. And typically, when we would be going through what we know as prom and getting ready to graduate, it was my grandfather. They were down there decorating the hotel where they were prepared to uh, celebrate. And they got word that trouble was coming, right, on May the 31st. Trouble was coming. They had no idea. 75 years later, survivors like Vinnie Sims and George Monroe still remember the horrors they saw as children. We could hear the bullets were falling in our yard. And that's when my father told us that we got to go. We didn't know where to fall down and run or where to hide. You didn't have nowhere to hide but go in the house. And we sat there and could see the blaze of the fire, you know, where they were burning and things like that over on this side of the Tulsa. What I remember mostly 
is when all of a sudden my mother was excited is because that she saw four men coming toward our house and all of them had torches, lighted torches on their side coming straight to our house. We could hear planes and knew the fighting was going on here and the shooting and things. Because you could, it was just like a, you know, just a boom, 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 boom. That's all you could hear was boom, boom, boom. Police were unable or unwilling to stop the violence, possibly because the police chief had sworn in hundreds of white mob members as special deputies. The National Guard was called in. Firemen were unable or unwilling to stop the conflagration. They were taking the wounded, you know, they had to set up a place where they would take the wounded. They had cots, you know, these army cots. That's what the wounded was on. They were there with legs, soul shot up, um, just all types of wounded men. When these people came in, these four men came in, they walked right past the bed, right straight to the curtains in the house. And they set fire to the curtains. And as a result, everything in and around was burning. And that's what I remember more than anything else. And that eventually, they left after then. And eventually, this fire caused our house to burn down completely to the ground. I learned what was destroyed in our family. I know the, the, the terror that they experienced when they were in their home and, uh, you know, they were hiding in the bathtub. And they had a neighbor come by that made <laughs> my relatives get out of their own bathtub so that they could have some kind of safety. Uh, I know the stories of people going down the train tracks and having only their suit of clothes and they would put on another pair of pants on top of that pair of pants, another jacket on top of that jacket, because that's all they had. And they would take off, right, trying to go to some kind of safety. The fact that the house, their very house, uh, was saved because um, there, there's a story that says that J.H. Goodwin, who was very fair complected, uh, he looked like a white man, right? He's very fair complected, but he was black. Um, uh, when the white racist mob was coming, he directed them away from the house, right? And they kept, they kept going. So he, that house was saved, but many of the other properties uh, were destroyed. And, um, and again, n never ever, nobody was ever charged, nobody ever convicted in terms of the murder, in terms of the looting, in terms of the burning, in terms of the terroristic acts that took place. And I am Judy Woodruff, and you have seen uh, just now a uh, just a short excerpt from that very powerful film, Tulsa, The Fire and the Forgotten, uh, airing on PBS. And I encourage everyone who can to try to watch the entire uh, film. I want to thank Ari Goldstein uh, for inviting me. I'm just so pleased to be here. It's an honor to be part of this program with these panelists uh, and to be part of a program uh, involving both the museum of Jewish heritage, as well as the Jewish Federation of Tulsa. It's a discussion, as we know, about an important moment in the history of our country, a moment that has received far too little attention, um, but which deserves not only to be remembered, but to be studied um, and to be understood as well as, as we can understand something so horrible, what humans are capable of doing to one another and, and to see what lessons we might learn from it. And I just want to add quickly that I have a, a personal interest in the subject because in addition to my interest as a journalist and as an American, um, I was born in Tulsa. Um, I lived there only until I was about five years old. My father was in the military. We lived and traveled around the world, different, uh, different bases he was assigned to. Uh, but I continue to have family in the state of Oklahoma across Tulsa. Uh, and that has only intensified my interest in the history uh, and my desire to learn more about what happened in 1921 and to learn about the legacy. I think it is so important to look at that and to look at the connections, some of what we're doing tonight between what happened in Tulsa 
1921 and the history of the Jewish people. We are so fortunate, as I said, to have this excellent panel, and I want to get to them just as quickly as I can. And Hannibal Johnson, I'm going to start with you. The film goes to the history of the Greenwood District, how it came to be the prosperous place that it was. But I want, I want you to flesh that out for us. Um, how did Blacks come to be living in Oklahoma in the first place, um, in Tulsa? How did they settle on Greenwood? Help us understand its place in Oklahoma um, and in American history. Well, there are two major waves of Black migration into Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma, before it became a state, was divided into twin territories, Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory. Some of the listeners may may know that the so-called five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Muscogee Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole were forcibly removed from the southeastern United States to what is now Oklahoma in the 1830s and 1840s. Now, in those migrations, those so-called trails of tears, uh, there were a number of people of African ancestry because all five tribes engaged in the practice of chattel slavery. So there were there were both free people of African ancestry and enslaved people of African ancestry migrating with the tribes in the 1830s and 1840s to what is now Oklahoma. Then in the late 1800s, there was a movement called boosterism. Oklahoma had a number of land runs and land lotteries, and some of the people who came on the land runs were black. So they staked claims, people like E.P. McCabe, who founded the town of Langston, where Langston University is. Uh, McCabe actually began recruiting other people of African ancestry to come to Oklahoma on the theory that they could escape the oppression that they faced in the Deep South and that there was abundant land opportunity and opportunity for, for wealth building. Uh, he was somewhat successful. He actually met with the President of the United States, Benjamin Harrison, in 1890, and they talked about carving out an all-Black state within what was then Oklahoma Territory. McCabe also was instrumental in founding the all-Black towns. Tulsa became the oil capital of the world in the early part of the 20th century and was on an upward trajectory at the turn of the century. Oil was discovered in places like um, Glenpool, for example, in 1905. So a fellow named O.W. Gurley, who's a person from Arkansas, a relatively wealthy black man, came in, in the land run in 1889. He migrated to Tulsa and he and other black men created this community that we call the Greenwood District. It's a segregated, Black community in Tulsa, part of Tulsa, separated quite literally by the Frisco tracks. It became a bustling business community, uh, much more of a Black main street with small businesses and service providers like doctors, lawyers, accountants, and dentists uh, than a Black Wall Street, which is the des designation given to the community. It wasn't an investment and banking community. It was a small business entrepreneurial community, really successful and became really the talk of the nation. And, and we heard in the, in the a little bit of the film that we just saw the, the exact circumstances about around how the, the, um, the events of May 31st and June 1st happened. But I think all of us want to know, how did, how did they get away with it? I mean, why was no one held accountable then? I know we know there was, I guess, one trial um, or a hearing, uh, but, but not much happened. I'm glad you asked that question because the incident that's talked about, the elevator incident, that's a trigger incident. There were a number of systemic factors that really are the cause of what happened in Tulsa. What happened in Tulsa is emblematic of the racial violence and racial trauma occurring in the United States during this period um, generally. Uh, so sociologists, historians often call this period the nadir of race relations in America, the low point. Because just two years prior, 1919, there were over two dozen major events called race riots in the United States. New York, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Omaha, Chicago, Elaine, Arkansas, Longview, Texas, and on and on and on. So what happened in Tulsa in 1921 is a continuation of this racial violence and racial trauma that afflicted the United States during this period. Also, this is a period during which lynching is prevalent throughout the United States. Lynching is a form of domestic terrorism aimed primarily at people of African ancestry. And so we have this racial crucible in the United States generally during this period. So then it's not surprising that no one was ever held accountable for the violence that occurred in Tulsa, as no one in most cases was held accountable for, for lynchings and for the other violence that occurred throughout the United States. 
And to Jonathan Silver, now how, I mean, the, the person who, who has looked at this so closely and put, put the documentary together about it, why was the story buried and frankly just not known? I mean, I have to say as somebody who thought I knew a little bit about, about American history, it wasn't until a few years ago that I even heard about uh, the, the Tulsa riot. Yeah, I, I, I've spent a career nearly 30 years um, looking at conflict um, and human rights abuses around the world, oftentimes for the news hour. Um, about two years ago, I read a very brief piece in the Washington Post um, talking about mass graves uh, discovered, possibly um, discovered in Tulsa. And I was fascinated because I've been in a lot of mass graves around the world and I had no idea that mass graves could exist in our country and uh, people not know about it. And I started researching the mass graves and I learned to my shame about the, um, not just the Tulsa massacre of 1921, but about this era of racial terrorism, um, which was given a name Red Summer. Um, I knew nothing about this, and I think I got a pretty good education. And the idea that racial terrorism is part of the American fabric that I knew nothing about compelled me to start digging into this. And I enlisted the help of my um, uh, friend and, and, and occasional collaborator, Eric Stover, who is the preeminent war crime investigator. And we, um, at uh, a very early stage, also included Deneen Brown, whose article spurred my initial interest. Uh, Deneen is a native of Oklahoma. Her father is a pastor in North Tulsa. And the three of us started investigating not merely the history of the massacre, but the present day impact of that massacre. Now, I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, I defer to experts um, on the subject of history but I do know something about current events. And I found it almost intolerable that a crime from a hundred years ago continues to have an impact, a, a, almost a marginalization of the black community in parts of Tulsa, and not just in parts of Tulsa, but throughout the United States. Um, and, and I think the film is a reflection of my outrage and my shame um, but it's also a reflection of our hope that once you learn a truth, you might be able to make some positive change. And I had the honor of seeing the Tulsa heart and Hannibal was, was one of the, um, the gentlemen who helped me get as close as I could to that truth. And, and I, I do wanna remind everybody who's joining us that I'm gonna, you're gonna have an opportunity to ask questions in the chat function if you could Put your questions there. I think Ari told us that earlier, but just a reminder, we're going to continue our discussion. And then for the last 10 minutes of the hour, we're going to take your questions. Um, but Jonathan, how, tell us a little bit about the making of the documentary. How difficult was it to get information? Was it readily available? How hard did you have to dig to get what you found out? Right. Well, the, the, the film began in one world and ended in quite, a, quite another. We started shooting in October 2019. And that was an exploratory shoot to prove the concept. That is the concept that this film is, is viable, that the issue is viable, that we were ahead of the curve, so to speak. I think there are a number of films on the subject coming out around the time we premiered. Um, and and I, I, I have to say that very few people acknowledged crime and acknowledged that it was worthy of a documentary. So we spent probably several months on our own dime um, doing exploratory filming, not just in, in Tulsa, but throughout the country. Um, and then the world changed when the pandemic struck and suddenly it became a near impossibility to do the kind of journalism that I do, that you do, that, that the best of us try to do, which is immerse ourselves in an environment and embed ourselves with people. Um, individuals are the heart of the films I make and the journalism that I do. And getting people to participate in this film meant exposing them to a certain risk. After all, I was flying into Tulsa. It, it was an eight hour flight with connected planes. Um, and no one knew at that time, you know, who was a conduit for the pandemic, who wasn't. Um, so a lot of people, including Hannibal and others took a risk to take part in this film. 
Um, once we got to Tulsa, though, it was fairly it was fairly straightforward because this hidden history was only hidden to people like me. It was common knowledge among Tulsa's Black, or I should say African-American community. Um, early on when I began the film, I had a conversation with the actress Alpha Woodard, who's from Tulsa. She told me about her, how she learned about this, this history. She said she was a student in high school and one of her classmates asked about racism in Tulsa. And her teacher closed the door, probably locked it, drew the shades, turned off the lights and told the assembled class about the 1921 massacre. Um, it was to her a revelation, obviously, but it also revealed something about how suppressed this was. Um, thankfully in 2020, when the principal photography really commenced, um, there was no suppression. People were, were happy to talk freely about what their ancestors had experienced more importantly, what they were experiencing in the present day. So many questions I want to ask each one of you, um, but I'm mindful that that we have only an hour. So Hasia Diner, I want to come to you about um, what do we know about the Jewish community in Tulsa at that time? Okay, so um, thank you for inviting me, Ari. And um, so it was a community, it was by 1921, um, it was a, still a relatively young community. The first Jews arrive at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and like their peers uh, in other new communities around the United States, they come in because of economic opportunities. Um, it was primarily a community made up of shopkeepers uh, and uh, also a not insignificant uh, number who um, were drawn there by the oil business and uh, some of whom did fabulously well. Um, they uh, were able to um, put quotes around this word, make it uh, in that um, they were white, okay? And uh, they lived like white people in Tulsa. Um, they uh, had access to civic rights. Um, there's actually a um, Jewish man in um, Oklahoma who was a state treasurer in 1913. So they were able to kind of, despite being primarily immigrants from Latvia and Lithuania, they were able to uh, move up, uh, which doesn't mean that there wasn't um, place, there weren't places that where they were restricted. Okay, it doesn't mean that there wasn't some level of antipathy, um, but um, they were essentially left free to create synagogues, to create communal institutions, um, they, uh, and, and to do well um, in the um, Tulsa economy and move um, pretty comfortably, I'd say, I'd say very comfortably in um, uh, public space. Um, clearly the point at which this uh, massacre takes place um, takes place in the shadow of the rise of the Klan or the second Klan. And um, some Jews um, did get threatening letters from the Klan and the Klan, as we know, that second Klan um, of the post-World War I era was, um, it, 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 would, it did not discriminate against uh, 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 black, uh, uh, residents or black uh, people, but it was equally anti-Semitic and it was anti-Catholic. And um, so the Jews were put on edge uh, by the high level of Klan activity in, um, in, in Oklahoma, as well as in the country as a whole. But there's no evidence that um, the arrival of the Klan and its thriving uh, in any way put a lid on Jewish economic mobility um, or on um, Jews' access to participation in civic life. And, and Hasia, it, what was the reaction? You said, I mean, if we use 1921 as a demarcation, what was the reaction that we know of in the Jewish community after this? Okay, so I mean, it's a great question because on the one hand, I want to, I want to, um, distinguish between two levels um, or possibly even three. And so there is some evidence that individual Jews um, did um, ri rise to the occasion and find um, their servants, 
okay, or their the employees of their stores um, and provide them with some shelter. So they acted as good rescuers. Now, they means individual here and individual there. And I don't think we have any numbers to say the Jews of uh, uh, Tulsa responded that way. But on the other hand, um, there is absolutely um, no paper trail of rabbis in Tulsa. There were several by then giving sermons, decrying this. Okay, we have no evidence of um, uh, the Jewish um, communal institutions taking a public stand in Tulsa itself and um, in a way standing uh, up and uh, being upstanders um, to this um, frenzied uh, mob. And I don't think we have to be condemnatory of them because um, who among us would uh, be willing to, um, uh, given the descriptions that we just saw in Jonathan's film and they were harrowing, um, who would stand up against that? Uh, uh, and more likely, we could imagine people like most of the Jews of Tulsa going into retreating into their homes, locking the doors, and um, hoping that this would 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 pass. Um, interestingly, there's at least right. one person. You sound, you sound like an apologist. I don't understand how anyone with any decency, especially the Jewish community, could retreat when 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 this monstrosity is taking place. And and I'm not I'm 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 I'm, I'm saying this. With, with all due respect, but there were yeah. very good people in Tulsa who stood by and did nothing. And they might have- Well, been I, I, you know, again, I, it's, it's, I mean, you're, you, I don't think I'm um, uh, meaning to be an apologist, but rather to say that in moments of this kind of communal madness, this frenzy of violence, the airplanes flying above, the mobs with torches, um, I think one is hard pressed to imagine. I try to put myself in that position. Would I risk my life? I don't know. I mean, I'd like to think I would. And so I think I wanna put myself a bit in the shoes of people who were unarmed, who uh, were um, uh, unable, in a sense, had no clout to, um, to do anything. Uh, now, again, I, I'm not, I also say that there's no one speaking up. I mean, there are no rabbis who get up and make fiery um, sermons or um, who say, I cannot do business in the future with these people who I know were murderers. So um, I think in the context, even of the Holo this Holocaust uh, memorial site, um, the scholarship on the Holocaust talks about bystanders. A group, you know, a kind of probably that middle, you know, people, people who are not the perpetrators, but by their not speaking up become bystanders. And um, I think we as individuals can make our judgments, but as a historian, we think most people at most times are bystanders. And um, they say, I hope this you passes me, me by. I to interrupt, but you asked me earlier about how difficult it was to make this film. The right. protest of last summer made this film a moral imperative for me because it, 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 it's very easy to see racial terrorism as a continuum, not just from 100 years ago, but probably from before in this country. And I was never prouder in my lifetime than seeing the kids, Asian, white, black, <laughs> joining hands and protesting the murder of a black man in the streets of Minneapolis. And, and that to me is the dignity that is missing from the Tulsa massacre of 1921. I don't, Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. And I Hannibal on this, but I don't. Yeah, I want to, and I want to bring Hannibal back into this because, I mean, we, we look at throughout history, human history, there are examples of human beings doing terrible things to each other. And in some instances, the bystanders have stood up and, and tried to stop it, but in many others, they haven't, you know, for, for a whole list of reasons. Hannibal, what, over time, what kept this story alive? I mean, it's, uh, it, it lives, lived in the memories of those who had family who passed those stories on, but what allowed it to live? Well, the story is ultimately not about the massacre. So the, 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 the the story is really about the indomitable human spirit. 
And we, when you think of it that way, and you think of a broader conception of the narrative, then you understand why it has this through line to the present. We live the legacy of, of what happened in that, that era. Um, those people who had incredible vision, had um, perseverance, faith, hope, resilience, those are, those are character traits that were transmitted in successive generations, even though the wealth transfer, interestingly, was disrupted in 1921, because we have people here, Debbie Stratford, O.W. Gurley, people who were, were millionaires, uh, if, if we could convert their, their earnings to present value, that wealth was not trans, that did not transfer across generations. And we talk about all, regularly, the wealth gap, the 10 to one wealth gap, black wealth is, is typically one tenth that of, of white wealth. Some of, the, some of these events in our history, these um, racialized events and racial traumas are part of the explanation of the wealth gap in addition to causing psychic trauma. Yes, and, and I, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking it's not only the, the story of the human spirit, it is the story of those who did have the courage from moment to moment to write about this, to speak about this. And um, Hasi, I do wanna come back to you because I know from what you were sharing with Ari and me and the others ahead of time was there were some in, I guess, the Yiddish press, the Jewish press around mm -hmm. the country that did write about what was going on in Tulsa. Right, so there's a, an interesting disjunction because again, we have a kind of silence coming out of Tulsa. That's but not true. That's not true. I'm sorry. That's not true. This, this well, was let me, in if the I national could, press. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Yeah. If, if I could, if I could just let Hasia make her point and then Jonathan, I'll come back to you for, for a comment. Okay. Hasia, go ahead. I'm talking about a Jewish silence that the uh, Jewish population of Tulsa had uh, no words to share about what they witnessed. And uh, one can say they uh, continued to live comfortably in that place. Okay, and what memories they may have carried with them does not get recorded in um, their publications and in the, again, the kind of repertoire of words that come out of it. But on the other hand, from a national perspective, the American Jewish magazines and newspapers in English as well as in Yiddish um, were incredibly uh, uh, passionate and articulate in pinpointing um, this event. And uh, indeed, I got a PhD in American history and I even took a um, graduate course with John Hope Franklin uh, at the University of Chicago. And we know his father was one of the uh, people who um, you know, was so severely, uh, you know, was, was so um, affected by that and was there. And um, unless my memory does not serve me well, um, <clears throat> Professor Franklin never talked about it in class. The class uh, on um, uh, what was then called ne the, his the Negro history uh, from reconstruction uh, into the mid 20th century, and it didn't come up in class. And I found out about the Tulsa uh, massacre because I wrote my dissertation and a book on the way in which American Jews in those early decades of the 20th century right. responded to the issue of race in America. And there it was in the American Israelite coming out of Cincinnati, out of the Yiddish press across the spectrum in terms of ideology, which linked the, uh, Tulsa, the Tulsa massacre as well as the race riot, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the massacres in East St. Louis and um, Elaine and uh, uh, so many of those other places uh, to the, um, both their own experiences um, in, um, in Europe uh, before uh, coming to America and which were still going on through, um, as well as to what they saw as the great um, be American betrayal. That is America had an ideology and it had documents about freedom and um, these uh, massacres um, in specific um, and the general treatment of um, uh, Blacks were a violation of that. I, and I would be curious to know how other faiths responded, whether it was the same thing, pretty much silence 
in pulpits of every denomination across the board in Tulsa. I see Hannibal nodding. So there, there are some, there are some, there are some exceptions that we should, we should actually elevate. One, one is First Presbyterian Church, still a viable large congregation downtown. The other is Holy Family Cathedral. Both those congregations were active, particularly post massacre, in providing essential relief, food, shelter, clothing. And these and were white. These were these are white. These are white churches. White and the minister at First Presbyterian Church, Dr. Charles Kerr, was was even more active. He actually uh, sought to intervene with respect to the mob before the mob attacked the Greenwood community. Post massacre, he quite literally drew up a petition to Congress for reparations for the Greenwood district. So, so we need to know that. Right. Jonathan, I want to come back to you because you were taking issue with uh, what Hasi was saying about not enough, there weren't, there weren't enough Jewish voices speaking up in Tulsa at the time. I, I, I don't know about the Jewish voices, but I know that this made headlines from coast to coast and, and many, many journals and newspapers deplored it. Um, the facts were always uh, somewhat variable, but but the issue was known coast to coast, and 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 this idea that um, you know the Jewish press was was these you know a voice of of reason or deploring it, I think, um, gives it a, a type of exceptionalism which is mm -hmm. undeserved. There were there were many many journals and journalists. And uh, boy, people were deploring it from pulpits across the country. So, um, and, I, yeah. what sorry. did you say? I didn't uh, say yeah. that only Jews spoke out in their. What did, did I mean to suggest it? But but this wasn't suppressed at the time of the event, and and the silence that that fell over Tulsa or over the massacre, I should say, seems to me to have happened in the aftermath. Um, uh, Hannibal says in the film very specifically that um, that the um, uh, city fathers, that the civic leaders did everything they can to move on and pretend that this did not happen. I'm paraphrasing badly. Um, but, but, but to me, the actual reporting at the time was fairly accurate and was also, I think, um, pretty condemnatory of, of this happening. And I guess my question is, if that's the case, why didn't that survive? I mean, how did that get snuffed out? Here, um, I think. Yeah, like, so it, th th there are a number of dynamics that cause what some people call a cons conspiracy of silence. We've got to remember, 1921 Tulsa is on the up upward trajectory of becoming the self-described oil capital of the world. So the city fathers really wanted Tulsa to be marketed as a cosmopolitan city. So what happened in 21 is a, pardon the pun, black mark on, on the city. And so, so best to just not talk about it. There was shame. Somebody mentioned the word shame. There certainly was shame in sectors of the white community over what the white community had allowed to happen in Tulsa. There was post-traumatic stress disorder and fear in the black community. Survivors would say 20 years ago, you know what, we didn't talk about this really in our family because we didn't want to burden our kids with this heavy load. We thought it might be debilitating for them. So we just avoided it. So it's, it's all those, it's all those yeah. psychological dynamics that are at play that cause this conspiracy of silence. Uh, it, and it's so in important that we talk about this because it, of course, has connections to the Jewish experience um, in, in Europe and, and uh, other, you know, elements of the human experience over time. But Hasia, what about that? I mean, what do we learn from this series of events? And we keep, and we want to, again, we want to remind everybody, we're not just talking about what happened on two days in 1921. It was what was happening over a period of time that just, and this just happened to be a particularly horrible uh, moment. Right. Well, I think we learn, um, and perhaps <clears throat> it's um, hardly a new lesson, um, that in this country, okay, race matters, and that the history of this uh, nation was um, shaped for centuries before, and uh, centuries before 1921 and continues to this very day in which the optics of 
skin pigmentation um, is the great divide uh, between the right to be in your home and lock the door or the liability of being in your home and having somebody set it on fire and having no recourse. And um, the, now I don't think Americans are necessarily unique. I think most, most societies have their uh, moments where they have uh, brutalized and uh, uh, treated others um, with a kind of lack of humanity. But for us as Americans, um, race matters. And uh, for those people who show up who are defined as being on the correct side of the race line, um, they might be occasionally scared. They might feel anxiety now and then, but they have access to the uh, uh, institutions of the society to protect them, okay? And for those people on the wrong side, and wrong obviously not as a judgment, but in terms of the uh, hierarchy, okay? It doesn't matter if they were comfortable shopkeepers or lawyers or ministers, um, they were uh, black and that was enough to deprive them of their rights. And um, how this country will move to uh, some kind of reconciliation and um, move beyond that. I, I'm a historian, so I can't make any predictions for the future, but we sure have to. Jonathan, before we take the questions from, from our audience, do you still have questions about that time and, and what happened in the aftermath? I have questions about complacency. I, I, I don't know how you can continue to not just suppress history, but oppress a people. Um, the, the standard of living in North Tulsa is a direct function today of what happened 100 years ago. And, and one of the um, principles in the film is a young activist and organizer named Greg Robinson. And he said to me very early on in, in, in my production that where would black Tulsans be if they had a hundred years of economic success behind them? And it, it, it hit me in the solar plexus because at every juncture, American, I'm sorry, white Americans have taken what opportunity and success and ambition that black Americans have earned and destroyed it. Um, and I don't mean to be provocative, but I, I, I think that it is a literal truth. And until we recognize that, we'll never get to a place that the, that is, you know, that, that shining city on the hill. I, I, I don't mean to be facetious like that, but I think that we need to understand that there have been strategic efforts to dispossess and deprive Black Americans of what they should rightfully have. We are getting some really wonderful questions coming in. And Ari, you're monitoring this. Do you want to direct me to which question? Because I'm seeing the chat room and I'm seeing questions um, and I can just plunge right in. Um, uh, here, you feel I just messaged you, but feel free to take any that you are uh, so moved by. Great. Um, let's see. I'm I'm just going to take it, it, here's here's one, and I and I'm going to direct this to Hannibal. If you could narrow this down to one statement for all of us to move forward, what would it be? What would be your message for how we the lesson we learned from this? We've in a way we've been talk we've all been talking about that, but what would you? How would you put it? It is imperative that we recognize our shared humanity. That's my statement. It's as simple as that. It's universal. It's what, what, what needs to happen, um, and it's, a, it's sort of lofty and aspirational, is that we recognize and value and validate the dignity and worth of every other human being around us. If we had done that in 1921, there would not have been a massacre. If that had happened in the 1940s, it would have not have been a Holocaust. If that had, if we had if we were doing it now, there would not be a George Floyd. There's another question. Does it, does either one of you, Hasi or Jonathan, want to want to comment? It was uh, said so beautifully. Yeah. What beautifully our outsides said. are is irrelevant. We need to recognize that we're just all people with the same aspirations, and um, that's it. 
There's a question uh, from one of our one of our audience. Why is the event now called a massacre rather than uh, a riot? Are there other words that could be more appropriate? Jonathan, what do you think? Uh, I, I can only share what I was told, but if you call something a riot, insurance companies can claim a riot exemption and not pay um, uh, what's due on a policy. Hannibal, is that is that accurate? I'll, I'll try to make. I'll try to be quick, but I have a. It's, this is a really complex question. It seems very simple. So the, 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 the transition from riot to massacre occurred because people in the community want, wanted to sort of take back the naming rights for the event. So my thing is critical thinking. Ask the five essential questions we need to ask when we talk about nomenclature. Who gave the event its name? What's the consequence of the name? And you talked about the right exclusion, that's the consequence. Who was absent from the table when the event was named? What are some other things that we might call this event? And there are many. And then finally, if the event happened today, what would you call it? So we could call this, riot has some application as does massacre, as does pogrom, as does ethnic cleansing, as does Holocaust, as does genocide, as does slaughter, as does, um, all assault, there, there are a number of terms that have some bearing on what happened. What I want people to do is think critically about the naming. Go through those, that litany of questions and then make your own decision. So I, I'm not put off by any particular term as long as you go through the process of, of thinking about why you chose that term. Is, is riot though a legal definition which provided exemption? Riot is a term that was used in insurance policies and what's called force majeure clauses. So if the damage was occasioned by riot or civil unrest, the insurance policy typically would not pay proceeds. And so that's why labeling it a riot in part was really important at the time. A number of questions continue to come in, Hasia. One of them is, was remind everybody, was Greenwood rebuilt? How long did it take? And also separately, what happened to the reparations proposal? Um, one of you addressed that, I think it was Hannibal, but what about the, just the Greenwood story? What happened to it as a place? Yes, it was rebuilt, uh, peaked in the, in the early to mid 1940s. And reparations, what happened to that? There were not, uh, certainly not, not cash reparations paid to survivors or descendants. Um, there are a number of efforts that I would say fall broadly under the umbrella of reparations, which means to make amends or to repair the damage. Uh, my priority has been curriculum reform, interestingly. Um, there's a, a man named Phil Goldfarb writing to Hasse. He said, I wrote a story in the upcoming May 1st Tulsa Jewish Review titled Jews and the Tulsa Race Massacre. I've included 10 stories of Jews helping blacks during this time, names such as Darrow Livingston. And he goes on, Borston, which reminds me of Daniel Borston, the former um, librarian of Congress, um, the late Daniel Borston. It had an effect even outside of Tulsa, Punka City and Stillwater um, due to the KKK. Uh, there are several questions here about the KKK and their role. Um, Hannibal, is there anything more you'd like to say about that? I mean, you talked about the second KKK. Yeah. Just, just very briefly. The KKK had a huge presence in Oklahoma throughout the decade of the 1920s, including in Tulsa. A number of prominent Tulsans were affiliated with the Klan. The records from some of the Klan, from the Klan, from some of the years in the 1920s are housed at the University of Tulsa. It's a veritable who's who list, cross-sectional Tulsa society. Um, being in the Klan was a badge of honor at the time, and that that seems strange now, perhaps, but. But, but it wasn't anything to be ashamed of at the time in the white community. Um, here's a question from Greg Licht. It looks like Lichter, the name is partly cut off. It wasn't until I watched the series Watchmen that I and possibly most white Americans even heard of the, tech, tech, the Tulsa race massacre. It is the case that, you know, again, we're reminding it, so few people knew, knew about this. Um, and I, I come back, Hasi, to what you said about um, um, your professor, John Hope Franklin's father, mm -hmm. not bringing it up um, in the coursework. 
And, you know, ironically, he, um, one of the other faculty members in our history department uh, was, was Daniel Gorston. And I have tried since Ari asked me to participate in this uh, uh, um, gathering, I've been sort of trying to imagine if um, John Hope Franklin and Daniel Gorston ever in the faculty lounge with the nice furniture and the thick rugs ever brought this up with each other. Now, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Goldfarb wrote that the messages are flying up as I'm looking at his chat. He says, Samuel Borston, attorney and friend of B.C. Franklin, was the father of Daniel Borston. So, right, yeah. And he so, was the lawyer for the Tulsa Times. So um, he was, in a way, the lawyer for one of the newspapers that did a lot to stir up uh, uh, and fan the flames of um, hysteria. I'm sorry, Tulsa Tribune, to fan the flames of hysteria you know, among the white readers. And so how many people picked up that newspaper and read this and, you know, decided to go out and join the mob? Who knows? So there's a really uh, interesting little uh, kind of historic connection. Judy, can I tell you from the, from the Watchmen issue? Yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I'm kind of conflicted here because as much as I deplore the cartoonization of American culture, if it if it's an entry point for people to learn more, exactly, I exactly. think that it's it's useful, um, but useful insofar as it gets them into the truth about the uh, the actual event. It raised their curiosity. It, it's it, I'm, I've heard that from a number of people. There's a there's another just a, a postscript on Daniel Borst and his son John is coming to Tulsa for the 100th anniversary. Um, coming up. Um, let's see. Oh, and this is for you, Hannibal. After May, after May, June of 1921, did the Black community continue to live in that area? Did they go somewhere else? Some of this, some of this is referenced in the documentary, I know. But if so, what steps were taken to protect them from, from another terrible thing like this? Well, you know, one of the reasons for the relative silence, including in the black community, is fear. So there, there were no steps to protect them from this, from a recurrence of, of this kind of racial violence. That was the order of the day in the United States, not just in Tulsa. Uh, the community was rebuilt. Most black people did stay, but they stayed in part to send a message about, about resilience uh, and, and about their ability to persevere even through these, these hardships. Where would they go? Where would they get, if they left, where would they go? Were they part of the Great Migration though? I think one of the problems that the um, uh, forensic scientists have now is that so many of the heirs, descendants have scattered throughout the country that it's going to be almost impossible to gather DNA to but, identify the remains. So- Right, but I, th I thought the, the question is really immediate post 1921. I mean, right. th those, those people pretty much stayed. Um, those people were still living and, and, and uninjured pretty much stayed. Uh, now, since then, I mean, low these many years, it's been a hundred years. So descendants are everywhere. Um, one of the descendants that most people didn't know about was a famous musician in Paris. He died like a year, year or two ago. So they're everywhere. I, I confess that my American history is so poor. I did not realize that uh, some of the native Americans had owned enslaved people. I learned that from watching this documentary. Well, you know, you, you can't be expected to know it if it's not in your textbooks. That's how we get our information. We go to particularly public schools. I mean, if, 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 if the information is not um, made readily available to the masses through textbooks and through public education, then the fact that you don't know it is it shouldn't be surprising to anyone. Well, our time is just about up. I just want to finally come back to you, Jonathan, because it's your uh, documentary, your film that we want to encourage everyone to see. And, and of course, we want everyone to continue to, to reflect on, on what we've been talking about and to read more into it, uh, to talk about it with people you know. Uh, but Jonathan, what message would you send us away with? That we're not the country we think we are. We're not the people we think we are. 
And the sooner we learn that, the better we'll be. And Hasia, what about you? Um, I think that um, for many of us, uh, we never thought it was that. And we hoped it would become it, but it was always something that not necessarily the specifics of this massacre, which again, I learned only when I started doing my dissertation, um, but we knew this horrible history of slavery and Jim Crow, depending on where you were in the American world, it was with us and uh, we knew it. And it was, what can we do? I began my sort of involvement with this as a high school student going to demonstrations and um, going out there with my, you know, black, uh, my core button black with a white equal sign on it um, and mocked by my uh, peers in high school. Um, it was, ne we, we, we should have, people should have never thought it was um, uh, already a um, finished product of equality, but uh, the road to it was always long and burdensome and, and, and bumpy. And Ari, I'm going to turn it back over to you with thanks again to Hannibal um, for your work and of course to Jonathan and to Hasia. Thank you very much. Ari? I don't want to add too many more words on this um, terrific exclamation point that you guys have left us with, but I, I do want to express our deepest thanks on behalf of everyone at the museum for each of you, Jonathan, Hannibal, and Hasia for sharing your insight, and Judy for, for walking us through this history and helping us reflect on it. Uh, I think this is a really important discussion. We will, we have recorded it and we'll share a recording with everyone who registered tomorrow, along with links to Hannibal's book, Judy's book, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Heise's book and, and other resources for exploration. And we hope you will watch Tulsa, The Fire and the Forgotten, which will premiere on PBS on May 31st at 9 p.m. Eastern. So without further ado, uh, our deepest thanks and we wish everyone a good evening. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be part of this.